Hi, Andrew Penn back again to continue our conversation about psychotic disorders, focusing in this module specifically about the diagnoses. Now that we've covered some of the nomenclature and the way we think about symptoms, especially upon exam, we're gonna talk about the specific diagnoses that comprise the family of psychotic disorders. Now, this is a little confusing, as you'll see from this diagram, there, is a, there are a number of clusters which can have psychotic symptoms as a uh, part of their presentation. So I'm going to start with affective or mood disorders. So this is things such as bipolar disorder, major depression with psychotic symptoms. And then we have the schizophrenia spectrum disorders. So these are, so in most purely sort of schizophrenia presentation, and you can see there's significant overlap between the two disease states. Uh, so bipolar disorder falls tend, tends to feel, fall a little more on the affective or mood disorder side in that the psychotic symptoms tend to be episodic. So they, by episodic, I mean they only occur when somebody is in an acute mood episode. Typically when somebody is, is presenting with mania, but sometimes with severe depression, you can see some uh, mood congruent, and by that I mean sort of dark or like guilty or nihilistic, uh, delusional material, for example, somebody might have a, a hallucination that they are smelling their their own flesh rotting. Um, but mostly, we see psychotic symptoms in the manic phase of the illness. So somebody might have grandiose delusions that they are the next Mark Zuckerberg, for example. Um, so that's a place where we can see psychotic symptoms. We can also see it in major depression. Again, similarly to the bipolar depressive presentation, these can have a very negative affective tone. Uh, and tend to be more, uh, more presenting with significant vegetative symptoms. So this is where somebody's going to have a very hard time thinking clearly, and uh, they're going to have a lot of negative, what we call negative symptoms. When these two overlap and the psychotic symptoms persist throughout uh, mood episodes, so whether or not the person is in a stable mood, a elevated mood or a depressed mood, if they continue to have psychotic symptoms, we call this schizoaffective disorder. Uh, people can have a brief psychotic disorder from which they recover. Uh, this really can fall in either category of either affective or schizophrenia spectrum. Schizophreniform, as I mentioned earlier, has to pers can only persist for up to six months. It's kind of a preliminary diagnosis for somebody who you think may be developing schizophrenia. Now, delusional disorders are a little more uh, unusual in that they are clearly circumscribed to usually one particular distorted thought, uh, whereas uh, uh, schizophrenia tends to have a more global presentation. In a delusional disorder, the person's thought distortion tends to be focused usually on only one or two specific situations. And then we have what we used to call the cluster A uh, personality disorders, just to make things more complicated. These are people who lean towards having uh, sort of a distorted view of reality and the people that are around them in a usually a more interpersonal kind of manner. We'll talk more about that in a moment. So let's talk about schizophrenia because this is really the most uh, a very common diagnosis. You've got to have at least six months of at least two of the following, uh, according to DSM-5. You've got to have delusions, which are those false beliefs. You've got to have hallucinations, which are erroneous sensory experiences. You've got to have, or you can have disorganized speech or grossly disorganized or catatonic behavior. So this is what I was describing earlier about uh, the gentleman who went from being a street musician to living in a pile of garbage. Um, this sort of bizarre and disorganized behavior. And then these what we call negative symptoms. So these are negative or deficit symptoms. Uh, I'll talk more about in a moment and contrast them to positive symptoms, just to whet your appetite. Uh, in schizophrenia, in somebody with, with significant schizophrenia is going, to have, is going to have impairment in their social, educational, or occupational uh, realms. And then you've got to exclude, for somebody who has schizophrenia, you've got to say they don't have a bipolar disorder, for example, uh, which would be a mood disorder, or they don't have major depression with psychotic symptoms, which would also be a mood disorder. They also have to say they don't have schizoaffective disorder, which is sometimes a more challenging diagnosis differential to make. And we have to say, we have to be confident this is not being caused by acute intoxication or medical condition. So those are exclusive. And like I said, you've got to, if, if it's less than one month, it's a brief psychotic disorder. If it's one month to six months, it's schizophreniform disorder. 
And after six months, we need to make a decision if we think this is developing into schizophrenia. Now I mentioned positive and negative symptoms. People get confused by this and it makes sense because it doesn't sound like there'd be anything positive about schizophrenia. But this is more kind of a mathematical way of thinking about it. It's thinking about what's added to the psyche is considered a positive symptom and what is taken away from the psyche is considered a negative symptom. So this isn't a judgment call. This is really more of an additive or subtractive kind of way of thinking. So things that are added to the psyche that are considered positive symptoms are things like hallucinations and delusions, and we've talked about those. Negative symptoms are more subtle, and this is really what causes the lion's share of uh, disability in, in schizophrenia. So these are things like the lack of spontaneity, or what we call avolition, or um, lack of motivation. Uh, a lot of times people with schizophrenia have very minimal facial expression. Their voice is often very flat. It's hard to tell what they're feeling, uh, and therefore it's very difficult sometimes to interact with people with this. And as such, a lot of times people with schizophrenia are very withdrawn. So you will see somebody who will stay in their room the vast majority of the day and really not seek out uh, social interactions uh, to a really marked degree. Um, thought blocking, I mentioned earlier, that's where a thought just sort of stops in the middle of a sentence and isn't picked back up again. And this term elogia is, a, is uh, used to describe that lack of speech or lack of thought. Sometimes the term paucity of thought or poverty of thought is uh, substituted for elogia. Now, it's important to remember that schizophrenia, first and foremost, is what's known as a thought disorder. So this psychiatrist, Kurt Schneider, came in the first part of the 20th century, categorized these distortions of thought that exist in schizophrenia. And these are sometimes referred to as Schneiderian first rank symptoms. So we've talked about uh, hallucinations, right? So that, that can take different forms. Uh, that can be somebody, uh, feels like somebody else outside of your head is saying your ideas. Or you can hear two voices, or more than two voices, arguing with each other. And this is a very common symptom. Commenting symptoms, especially negative, critical comments, are very common. You'll hear people say, my voice is telling me you're stupid, you should die. Right? And so we get concerned, especially if there are command hallucinations, and especially if the person feels compelled to follow those command hallucinations. The somatic delusions, I talked about the gentleman who I, I met who thought that there were earwigs eating through his brain, um, thought withdrawal and blocking we've talked about. Thought insertion is kind of the opposite of thought withdrawal. So it's like a thought that is not yours is placed into your brain. Um, thought broadcasting is where the person has a delusion that their thoughts are being picked up by other people. Um, a similar kind of symptom uh, is the idea of made feelings, so that the emotions that the person is, being ha is having uh, are coming from outside of them. And similarly, made impulses, like there is a machine trying to control me from outside. It's trying to make me do things. Um, and these are similar to made volitional acts. Um, and then, of course, delusional perceptions. Uh, paranoia often falls in that category. So let's take a look at these mood disorders that can sometimes have psychotic symptoms because this is a little bit confusing. So again, uh, in a mood disorder with psychotic symptoms, typically the psychotic symptoms only show up when the person is in an acute mood episode. So that is to say when they are very depressed or when they are manic. Okay, so this is, uh, these are the bipolar disorders and major depression with psychotic symptoms. And the psychotic symptoms is a modifier which is added to a major depression. So we call that major depression with psychotic symptoms. And again, if the person continues to have psychotic symptoms, even when they are not having a mood episode, we consider this to be schizoaffective disorder, which is considered its own disease state, even though you can see it clearly overlaps with several others. Um, now, with schizoaffective, if you're working with uh, seriously mentally ill folks, you will encounter a lot of schizoaffective disorder if you're at a county hospital or working in community care. Um, and so where you, you've either got this overlap of um, that they have uh, symptoms of schizophrenia or they have symptoms of a major mood disorder and those delusional or hallucinatory experiences continue to persist uh, even without an active mood episode. And of course, it's not because of a substance use disorder. Uh, and again, this gets very murky because there's a high comorbidity, high dual diagnosis. So a lot of these, uh, a lot of these folks are also using substances, 
which can interfere with uh, the presentation of, of psychotic symptoms. Now, I want to just describe a few outlier symptoms here, outlier presentations. So delusional disorder is, is fascinating because this is where the person only has delusions but does not have any of the other psychotic symptoms. They typically do not have hallucinations. They typically do not have that poverty of thought or a motivation. And usually these are uh, circumscribed to uh, one area. So an erotomanic delusion is a delusion that somebody is in love with them um, or that um, somebody is, is trying to seduce them, typically. Grandiose delusion might be something um, like, I'm going to be the next president of the United States. Um, a jealous delusion might be that a person, uh, despite all evidence, continues to believe that their partner is cheating on them. Persecutory might be that people are out to get them, uh, or that there are conspiracies of people out to get them. A somatic delusional disorder is that there is something uh, persistently wrong with the body that there is no evidence for. And then there are personality disorders. And again, this is where the DSM gets a little bit murky because uh, historically we put these in what were called cluster A, which were the sort of unusual personality disorders. And when we talk about personality disorders, we're talking about an enduring pattern across different symptoms, uh, across different areas of functioning. So of course this is happening at work, at home, at school, um, and it tends to be largely interpersonal. Uh, and these are, are sort of odd behaviors. Uh, they, there's sort of an eccentricity usually to them. A lot of these folks in this cluster, so this is schizotypal, paranoid personality disorder, and schizoid personality disorder. A lot of these folks have some similarities to um, people with schizophrenia, but often they don't have the degree of impairment. But they, you definitely see a lot of impairment in their interpersonal relationships. They often tend to be very idiosyncratic people. Um, sometimes their emotional range is sort of odd or restricted. And there may be some overlap here in what we now refer to as autism spectrum disorders or neuroatypicality. Um, so these are, are folks that tend to be kind of outliers. They're certainly not joiners. They tend to keep to themselves. Sometimes they have some odd and idiosyncratic beliefs. So we've covered the major diagnost diagnostic categories, and it's important to understand that we don't make a diagnosis just once. Diagnosis is an iterative process. We're often revisiting the, pro the diagnosis and rethinking it and considering if we should change it. Um, that symptoms can change over time. And it's important to educate families about this. A lot of times, families are very afraid of hearing that their child has schizophrenia. And that's very understandable. So I tend to be very careful with that diagnosis because it carries a lot of stigma. Um, and sometimes it's amazing what um, six months away from chronic cannabis use, um, getting better sleep and taking some antipsychotic medication can do for a young person who, was, who had to drop out of school because they were having delusions that their roommates were trying to kill them, for example. Now, some of those people sadly do go on to develop schizophrenia, but not all of them do. So um, we wanna do everything we can early in the disease course to try and reduce the stressors, provide additional supports, and also um, to really try and get people on medications that will be helpful for them. And this is sometimes where long-acting injectable medications, long-acting injectable antipsychotics can be helpful because um, they make it, as one of my patients said, I only need to decide to take my medication once a month. And you also wanna make sure you're treating the family and not just the patient. There's a wonderful uh, national community organization called the National Alliance on Mental Illness, uh, commonly known as NANI, which has uh, family courses, family support groups. Uh, they have a great program called Family to Family where, they, where uh, people who've been through this teach other people who are going through it about these conditions and how they're treated. Now, I don't wanna leave this talk without making some critique of psychotic disorders because there, there certainly is uh, plenty of things to critique about them. As you can see uh, by my diagnostic map, it's messy and we have a lack of diagnostic precision that frankly, I think people who are in uh, other areas of medicine might kind of laugh at. Um, you know, we, we would never say, well, that looks kind of cancer-ish, I'm not sure. Um, we would say, you know what, I'm gonna get a biopsy and I'm gonna get histopathology and we're gonna find out. Uh, but we don't have that luxury in psychiatry. So we don't have these good biomarkers and there's a lot of overlap and lack of specificity between the symptoms. And so that's a fair critique. Um, 
And uh, there's some people who also will bring a, a reasonable critique that we have excessively uh, biomedicalized uh, abnormality, that there have always been eccentric and curious people who don't quite fit in neat boxes, and that the psychiatric establishment has given these people diagnoses and told them that they are sick. Uh, and that if you want to go deeper into the critique, is that psychiatry has been critiqued, and sometimes correctly so, as enforcing hegemony and normalcy, and especially in communities of color. Uh, there's, there's a long and ugly history of uh, people of color receiving, uh, being overdiagnosed and overmedicated. And finally, uh, the, this is more of a philosophical question, but this uh, question that uh, Krishnamurti asked that, you know, if, if we're living in an, in, if, if we're living in an insane world, is it reasonable to be sane? Uh, that's really what he was saying here. And so uh, when the culture is sick, uh, is it surprising that sometimes people appear sick as well? So this is, we could spend a whole class talking about these critiques, and I'd be happy to bring this up with you in your, in your discussion section, but it's a, important questions to keep in mind. Um, we're going to talk um, about recovery goals, and we're going to talk about medications next, but I want to introduce this idea of psychosocial rehabilitation, that not only do we want to manage symptoms, and we want to manage the impact of diagnosis and treatment, because this is not insignificant. If somebody is in their second year of college and they begin to develop schizophrenia, it's probably going to make it very difficult for them to proceed at the same pace with going through college that they were on to begin with. It's not to say they can't finish college, it's not to say they can't get a job, but they're gonna need a lot more support than they would otherwise. And they're gonna need a lot of help managing the functional impairments of this illness. They may need help navigating interpersonal interactions which are affected by the symptoms of schizophrenia. They may need help managing the side effects of their medication, such as excessive sedation, which makes it so they can't get to an 8 a.m. class. And we want to help people determine their own goals on their own terms and live their own lives just like everyone wants. So we'll talk more about how we do that in the next module. Thank you.